Um, thank you to the organizer for putting together the conference. It's great to see everybody again. Uh, brings me back to our days in Tampa, except it's like uh, 10 Fahrenheit in here right now. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, very nice to see everybody. So I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, what I'm going to be presenting today is a work in progress. Um, it, it's an article that uh, will be published in Spanish um, about uh, how the image of Jose Marti is constructed in these three uh, female writers. Um, and it's really uh, interesting because yesterday James was talking about this, uh, how this image of purity and, 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 and the, the connection between Marti's literary work and uh, a strong ethical uh, uh, core in uh, how Marti is viewed um, uh, in general, right, uh, through history and, and speci specifically after his death and how his death is constructed as the higher point in uh, sort of sacrifice and, 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 and this idea of, of purity. So um, I will analyze how this is uh, revealed in the writings of uh, Gabriela Mistral, Ofelia Rodriguez Acosta, and Ofelia Garcia Marruz. Um, or actually, originally, um, what, what I intended to do is to include um, uh, an essay by um, a different uh, writer, which I will do in the final uh, paper. So uh, the texts that I'm going to be talking about are uh, La Lengua de Martí by Chilean writer Gabriela Mistral, uh, The Language of Martí, uh, published in 1934. Um, and it's interesting to say that uh, Mañach uh, introduced uh, this essay to the public uh, in 1934, and he spoke highly of this uh, essay by Gabriela Mistral on Jose Martí. Uh, this was uh, based on a conference that Mistral gave in Cuba in 1931, and I will give a little bit more details about that. Um, the second essay that I will be talking about is La Muerte Pura de Martí, uh, Martí's Pure Death or The Pure Death of Martí by Ofelia Rodriguez Acosta. It was published in 1953. And the, the, the author presented this essay as a sort of as a, a competition that was that year uh, in honor to Martí uh, to celebrate uh, the 100 years of his uh, birth. And the final uh, text that I'm going to be talking about is an essay uh, by Fina Garcia Marruz that she published in the journal Casa de las Americas in 2010, and is entitled uh, Introducción a los Versos Sencillos, uh, Introduction to Simple Verses. Um, so what I'm going to do is to find this common uh, theme, a common theme in these uh, essays about uh, these uh, three writers about Martí. So Gabriela Mistral almost uh, does not need to be an introduction, right? She's, she's uh, is the literary name of Lucia Godoy Alcayaga. She was the first Spanish American writer and the first uh, woman in, to receive the uh, Nobel Prize of Literature in 1945. Uh, she uh, is author among other uh, uh, volumes or collections of poetry, Sonetos de la Muerte, Sonetos of Death, Desolación, Despair, and Tala, Harvesting, and many other relevant collections of poetry, as well as children's songs. She, she's she's uh, a, a very uh, uh, revered author in uh, Spanish American literature. Uh, so Mistral visited uh, Cuba in four occasions. Uh, the first time she visited in 1922, she was passing through for Mexico. Then she came back in 1931, in 1938, and in 1953. So uh, this essay, uh, The Language of Martí, again, was based in this conference she gave in 1931 in the Teatro Principal de la Comedia. Uh, this place doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was situated in the street of Anima and Sulueta uh, in uh, Havana. So, uh, the, so what we know, the definitive text that we know now was based in this conference that she gave in Cuba and that was uh, promoted 
by the uh, Institución Hispano-Cubana de Cultura, Spanish Cultural Association, directed by Fernando Ortiz. So, and as I said, um, Mañach, uh, the author of Martí the Apostle, he spoke highly about how uh, Mistral had actually, uh, he said that she had given the most accurate representation of Martí that he knew up to that uh, point. So um, I am, uh, again, this is going to be published in Spanish and I have translated. Uh, so the quotes that I'm going to give from the authors, any mistakes in them are mine. Um, I'm, 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 I did the, the, the translation. So the first statement that Mistral uh, makes when she starts uh, her essay is, and I'm quoting, the first, the second, and the last impression of reading Martí hits you with his originality before anything else. Martí is truly an autonomous voice, and he rises in a coil of voices that are all imitation. We will see Martí to, in his manliness, <laughs> in, each, in each step of his life as a man. But since he started his literary career, we will see him too, men in his anti imitative nature, that is anti feminine. This is really, I, I, I thought this was really interesting. This is the end of the quote. And she identifies three main sources of this originality that she sees in Marti. And she says uh, these elements are his originality in his tone, the originality of his vocabulary the originality of his syntax. So she's talking about pretty much these qualities that she sees in Marti's writing. Uh, and, and also what we were saying yesterday is about she connects this to this um, ability that Marti has to be an extraordinary public speaker, an extraordinary man of that, that could move multitudes when he was uh, uh, speaking publicly. and and she links this ability to authenticity. So what she thinks differentiates Martí from the rest of the Spanish American writers on his time was the ability of Martí of being authentic. So she says, and I'm quoting, the secret of Martí uh, uh, um, it's that, in, that when he was uh, managing a genre, that's his public speaking of false virtues, he serves, he serves it with true virtues. So she links authenticity in Martí, uh, that that's what sets him apart in, from the rest of the uh, writers and, and Polish speakers of the time. And one of Martí's uh, virtues is his ability to mix in the transcendent with the familiar. So she says he is able to, he is able to say a sentence in, of Ciceronian uh, uh, flavor and, uh, and just after that, he is able to talk like a woman, a woman would do or like a child would do, right? So uh, he, he has this ability of mixing this high style with, uh, and she says, with an eighth adjective of the most beautiful popular flavor. So this ability of Martí of mixing the transcendent with the everyday uh, reality is also for her so uh, important in uh, and, and determining why is Martí so original. Uh, about Martí's vocabulary, uh, she compares Martí with Rubén Darío. And it's, it, this is really interesting because Darío was for many generations the epitome of the modernism, right? The innovator of new vocabulary, new language. And she says, before Rubén Darío, he had uh, achieved the invention of, of words. And Darío recognizes that. Uh, and she says, I like more the new words that come from Martí than the flooding <laughs> of words that we get from Darío. And this is a very personal uh, uh, opinion that she has about uh, Martí. Interestingly enough, coming from Chile, she talks about Martí's tropicalism and how this tropicalism is translated into Martí's vocabulary. 
uh, so she talks about the abundance of images, uh, this, this amazing uh, 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 language uh, full of metaphors uh, that Marti uses. And she uh, specifically says his metaphorical uh, richness, right, in, in Marti. So for Mistral, Marti's brilliance comes from essential qualities linked to authenticity, right? And she says, Marti wants everything for his people, freedom first, and then prosperity, culture, and happiness, finally. And because, um, and because style, whatever they may say, is the visible blade of the hidden windmill and reveals which is step our morals, even when he's not talking about morals, Marti's generosity is expressing his language in some kind of happy flexibility in his gratefulness of a man without qualms, in, in this happiness of a master used to give himself to others and receive and to have and flourish. So definitely for her uh, style, authenticity, and this purity uh, in Marti are linked through in, in his writing. So she says, there is no condescension with impurity in Marti, right? So, uh, and she says that that virtue is that he is a fighter with no hate. It's a, it's, it, it's a fighter without hate. And uh, she says, um, this is the best thing that I have to say uh, to finish her essay. Um, the modern world is turned upside down with that novelty of Mahatma Gandhi. And, and I'm quoting her, I'm quoting her. Uh, so uh, this uh, phenomenon so hard to achieve of fighting without hating appear among us in this American Cuba, in this saint, right? She's talking about this saint of, uh, of a fighter that we are talking about. So she's talking about this ability of Marti of fighting for people's independence without hate. And she links this to this, she called him saint, right? And that, and his, his purity in Marti's uh, fight for Cuban independence. So she uh, finishes saying, it's uh, all my love for Marti, it's, it's grateful. I'm, I'm grateful for the writer that is the el maestro, right? Uh, el, um, ma the American maestro more evident in my work. Above all, it's I am grateful, right? Um, and he, she says, hemisphere of gratefulness are for me, the literature and the life of Jose Marti. So again, there is this idea of connecting uh, this, this, this core ethical value in Marti with the way uh, he writes. And um, the second writer that I'm going to talk about, I didn't uh, know it at all until I left Cuba. I didn't have any idea about uh, Ofelia Rodriguez Acosta. Um, there is an anthology of her writing made by, um, edited by uh, Madeline Camara, uh, La Vida Manda y Otros Textos, uh, Life Rules and Other Texts. Um, and uh, that includes uh, the more famous of her seven novels, La Vida Manda from 1928. Uh, she wrote essays, she's, she wrote, uh, she was a journalist. And Ofelia Rodriguez Acosta, she uh, was an intellectual who had great relevance in the years between 1920 and 1940 that were so crucial in the uh, foundation of the imaginary of the, of, of the Cuban nation, right? So um, she um, published uh, many of her novels in this period, uh, the first decades of the 20th century uh, in Cuba. And she published essays and she published uh, uh, travel uh, uh, diaries. Um, she was born in Artemisa. Uh, she wrote, she published a lot in Bohemia. So it's not that she didn't have, uh, uh, she, she didn't have a, a publishing presence in Cuba throughout these years. Uh, she was a, a very important feminist activist uh, also in those years. Uh, as, uh, following Saida Capote, uh, she says that Ofelia participated actively 
in the uh, struggle against the dictator Gerardo Machado, and it's proof that she was in the demonstration uh, for the death of the student Rafael Trejo in 1930. She founded and directed um, uh, a journal, uh, Spartana, Spartan, in um, 1927. She was a librarian. Uh, she was, um, she directed El Club Femenino de Cuba in 1925, the Cuban Feminist uh, Club. And she, in, in her work, she defended the theory of the superiority of free, of, of free love against Catholic uh, morals. She, she affirmed that the freedom and the obstacle for the, free, for the freedom of women in Cuba were because of the restrictive norm of the Cuban society. And she defended the right of women to uh, freedom to uh, in the economic independence and, and social independence. Um, and she said that they, that should start from uh, liberating the women's uh, mind. So she was considered a socialist feminist uh, according to Stoner. And she, interestingly, she was what in that time was considered a woman with independent life, right? She never got married and she sustained herself uh, independently uh, through her work uh, as a writer. Uh, and Emilio Vergel says that this phrase, uh, being an independent woman, was considered a euphemism uh, to uh, talk about le lesbianism in Cuba at the time. So when they said she's an independent woman, that meant that, that she was uh, a lesbian. Uh, she, all, she was uh, highly, highly um, uh, criticized uh, by uh, many uh, Cuban uh, writers. Uh, she, uh, Ambrosio Fornet said that she suffered from the sexist distribution of authoral roles in Cuba from yesterday and today. And that uh, 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 in, in, in 1940s, she uh, left Cuba and established herself in Mexico. Uh, and, and actually when she received a very prestigious scholarship uh, from the Cuban government to travel to Europe as a journalist uh, and to publish her, her, her chronicles in uh, Grafo, in the journal Grafo, many uh, writers like Jorge Rigol ridicule her, uh, mock her, and, she, and criticize her, and saying that she was a mediocre intellectual, that she didn't deserve uh, the scholarship. So, so her life was not without all this uh, struggle uh, uh, coming from these expectations about uh, women in uh, the first decades of the 20th century in Cuban society. Uh, so uh, at this point, there is still a debate about uh, her, her, the day when she was born, or how she died, when she died, that is how unknown she is, uh, in, not only in Cuba, but in general, she is not uh, an author that receives a lot of uh, uh, attention, right? Um, so in the Pure Death of Martí that was published in the Accessory in Havana in 1953, uh, and um, Camara says that is to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Marti's death. It should be of his birth, right? Um, La Mu uh, she demonstrates how she turned into uh, mysticism. So she was a socialist feminist, and, and at, at the end of her life, she turned into uh, mysticism. And, and I think it, it's, it, yeah, it makes sense. Um, so she says, um, uh, there is no doubt that this is the most poetic of all of the author's work. This is Camara talking about this essay about Marti. It is very evident the abandonment of her faith in science and her openness to a philosophical idealist that favors the existence of the spirit independently of the matter. This philosophical idealist is open to an indefinite religiosity of Christian and mystic roots, and end of the quote. Uh, so, and Camara also points out that despite the essay of Rodriguez Acosta having remained mostly unknown, the text is in line and quote, with some of the mystical interpretations written later about Marti's death. So the essay about Marti's death, uh, is a, she, the author, uh, Acosta says, is a personal interpretation of the enigmatic internal movement that expelled Marti to his death. And she, uh, uh, put, put in italics, the enigmatic internal movement of Marti 
uh, that led him to his death. And her explanation uh, comes a few lines later when she says, everybody dies from his own death, says writer Maria Rilke. Marti could not die a warrior death. Marti could give his life, but he could not die killing. Marti had to die without killing. Um, so he had to be what he has always been. And she put it in capital letters, the pure. So she denies that they would take away what people call his manliness. Uh, uh, and she, again, also compares Marti to Gandhi. Um, uh, and she says that nobody would question Gandhi's virility because of his ethical and spiritual strength. She says that Marti's death cannot be understood by rational means. She says, and quote, his desire of death was offering his life as a patriot. It was not a provocation. It was a willingness to die in a double dimension, the choice as free will and his readiness as internal knowledge of death. More than wanting it, more than delivering himself to death, more than defying it, Marti knew, and she underlines this, Marti knew that he was already going to die. Uh, so for Rodriguez Acosta, Marti's death was not an accident of the matter, but a spiritual act. And again, I see this, 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 this theme of purity and Marti's uh, choices. Uh, and she says, she links his death to ascension, right? In this very Catholic way of looking at uh, Marti's sacrifice. So she writes, looking to the stars, he did not think of killing. He thought of dying, end of the quote. His death was pure because it was elevation and that elevation excludes any act of violence. And she says, violence was a psychological impossible for Marti the negation of his integral being. And that is why Marti's death is pure, following to Rodriguez Acosta. And she said, salvation of the human condition of the man, dying without any sin against the divine condition of man. When I hear his voice saying, let's go, I think I hear these other words. Take away from me this chalice of bitterness, O oh Lord. But the stars are already looking him deep in his immortal eyes, that we're praying to them. So we see this idea, right, of constructing again uh, Marti as a saint, as this pure uh, man who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the name of uh, Cuban freedom, but without hate. And, and we, we see how this, uh, it, it is constructed, is constructed, right, this idea of this, this pure elevated uh, uh, being. And finally, I will talk about another brief essay by Fina Garcia Marruz. Uh, uh, she's also a very well-known um, poet. Essa is a, a member of the group Origenes. Uh, and I would say she is a canonical voice of Marti studies in Cuba, right? She has published extensively about Marti together with Cynthia Vitier. Uh, she has published texts such as uh, Los Versos de Marti, Marti's Verses. Uh, temas martianos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I would say this is a. When I ran into this essay, I thought it was a very unusual uh, text. Um, and for diff in, for me personally, uh, because she um, says, um, for example, uh, that uh, this was supposed to be an introduction that Casa de las Americas was supposed to publish. Uh, in, in, in a book to Simple Verses of Marti. And she's, she's, she, she has this footnote uh, in her essay that uh, clarifies that her original essay got soaked in the rain. And that's why there are some parts of the text missing that she is noting in square brackets. So, 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 so for me, this, this, this I mean, uh, to whom that happens anymore, right? We, we are so used to um, uh, using computer and how it does. so so this this took me to 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 a time in uh, in which uh, in which uh, it's a metaphor as I see it uh, of her manner of writing and her her way of approaching Jose Marti even in the 21st century. Uh, and I was talking the other day to a Puerto Rican friend talking about uh, how family albums doesn't exist anymore. Right? These 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 things that we used to 
go by the pages of the family album, looking at photographs. This doesn't. This, this is this almost. This is almost gone, and, and it, they are an expression of a way of life that is gone. And this friend said, "But we have now in these real squares on Zoom, right? So, so this 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 is replacing these new ways of experiencing uh, uh, things. And and I see a connection with uh, this essay of by Marus. Um, so." She, the other thing that, that, that was interesting to me is how she, in her essay, what she does is to link this discovery of some um, uh, um, uh, pictographies found in the caves in Punta del Este in the Isla de la Juventud in Cuba. There are these 28 circles, uh, concentric circles, right? And alternating black and red. And she says that these are reminds her of the law of analogous expansion that Martí so often talked about. So she sees in this art, uh, in these concentric uh, circles, um, she finds a correspondence between those and the myth of the cave of Plato from where the sun and the moon came with a verse, that very known verse in which Martí says, vengo del sol y al sol voy, I come from the sun and I go to the sun. So the whole essay is constructed on these analogies between Martí's verses and these uh, a pictograph created, as, as she said, are Indians, and I'm quoting, uh, including the mysterious presence of a cross that is also present in Martí's poem. So she is building all these foundational myths linking uh, Cuba's aboriginal inhabitants with uh, Martí's uh, writing. And I see this as uh, this idea that goes back to origines, right? Uh, this, this, this foundation of uh, the Cuban nation um, from this uh, religious and spiritual belief of the group origines. And even in the 21st century, she, she still, uh, this, that, this, this, this kind of reading hasn't changed for her, uh, right? She, 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 she still sticks to this very same reading of the, the uh, Cuban culture. Um, and I remember a prologue that she wrote for uh, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, and she did the same thing. She absolutely uh, defended the purity of uh, Sor Juana. There was no rebellion against the church uh, in Sor Juana. There was a personal spiritual crisis, nothing related to anything that could contaminate uh, the figure of uh, Sor Juana. Uh, and she, she, she was very adamant in separating any kind of real happenings in Sor Juana's life from this idea of uh, purity. And I see this is same insistence on the purity uh, in Martí and this living uh, Martí's figure, let's say, unsolid by any actual uh, experiences. Um, and um, I must say, really like shielding this idea of Martí from any kind of reference to the actual happenings in Cuba. And this is 2010. So what we see in these new generations, new interpretations of about Martí's figure, all these things that, the, uh, that, that express uh, this uh, uh, um, rebelliousness against the traditional ways of interpreting Cuban foundational myths, she, she definitely sticks to this, uh, the, the, the fun, this foundational myth that, that it was created by um, Origenes. And, and absolutely, she doesn't want any contamination with the reality of a country uh, uh, in the 21st century. So it's just like when you have this old family album of photos and you don't want to acknowledge, right? The marks of the rain, the effects of time in this foundational myth, right? That, that this, this, this remain unaffected. Uh, so, so this is, how, this is a, how I read <laughs> her essay. I'm not saying this is 